Just after midnight on December 12, 1978, Heinz Lohmann, the radio operator on a German cruise ship, the MS Caribe, was chatting with a friend, Jörg Ernst, the radio operator on the cargo ship MS München, sailing about 2,400 nautical miles away. Their conversation was casual, and they used a frequency designated for unofficial communications. The connection was hampered by atmospheric interference, and Lohmann could barely hear Ernst as he told him that the Munchen was fighting through a massive storm on the North Atlantic. The heavy seas already smashed in some portholes and did some minor damage to her bridge, but Ernst was unconcerned. The Munchen was a modern vessel designed to handle the worst that the North Atlantic could throw at it. She was considered practically unsinkable. After a minute or two, Ernst's transmissions became nearly inaudible. Lohman asked if he wanted to try another frequency, but he declined, and they decided to end their transmission. Ernst signed off by telling his friend, have a good trip and see you soon. Three hours later, at 3.10 a.m., the Greek freighter Marion picked up a faint SOS signal sent using Morse code. The message was almost indecipherable, but they were able to make out the Munchen's call sign, a position that would later prove to be incorrect, in the words 50 degrees starboard. Not long after, signals were received from the Munchen's automatic emergency beacons, and soon a massive international search and rescue operation was launched. But the Munchen and her crew were never seen again. Only traces of the massive cargo ship were ever found, leaving only a few clues that hinted at a horrifying end. On September 1st, 1970, the two legacy German shipping companies, Hamburg American Line, or Hopog, and Norddeutscher Lloyd, merged to create Hopog Lloyd. Today, it is the fifth largest container shipping company in the world. On May 12, 1972, as they expanded and modernized their fleet, the company launched a new vessel labeled Hole Number 860 at the Cockerell Shipyards in Belgium. Christened the MS München, the German name for the city of Munich, the new vessel was unique in that she was the only German flagged Lash carrier. A Lash, or lighter aboard ship, was a design developed in the 1960s by the American engineer Jerome Goldman. Similar to container ships, these vessels were designed to carry a number of small barges called lighters. They typically came equipped with a large crane that can lower individual lighters into the water, where they can be towed by a tug up smaller waterways. This made it faster and easier to unload and distribute cargo. The Munchen was 857.5 feet or 261.4 meters in length, with a beam of 105.5 feet or 32.2 meters and came in at 37,134 gross registered tons. She was powered by a nine-cylinder Solzer 9 R&D 90 diesel engine that generated 26,100 horsepower, driving a single five-bladed propeller to achieve an 18-knot service speed. She was well-equipped and designed to power through even hurricane force weather conditions. MS München was delivered to Hopog Lloyd on December 22, 1972, and she sailed her maiden voyage a month later on October 19. She had an identical sister, the MS Bilderdijk, which was built for the Holland America Line and sailed until she was retired at the end of 2007 and scrapped. In their early years, both ships proved capable, and their crews had little reason to worry even when navigating through harsh conditions, which they frequently sailed through as they delivered cargo throughout the year. The Munchen departed Bremerhaven for her 62nd voyage on December 7, 1978. She was bound for her typical destination in Savannah, Georgia, and her route would take her through a powerful storm that had been ravaging over the North Atlantic since November. But these were the types of conditions the Munchen was designed to handle, and she had already weathered similar storms during her career. There was no reason to believe this would be anything other than a rough, 
but overall routine voyage. She was commanded by Captain Johann Danekamp and had 28 people on board, including 25 men and three women. Her cargo consisted of 83 lighters that contained mostly steel products, as well as a replacement nuclear reactor vessel head for a company called Combustion Engineering Incorporated. The voyage began just like any other, but as the Munchen continued to the North Atlantic, conditions rapidly deteriorated as they approached the outer edges of the storm. And by the evening of December 11th, just north of the Azores, they found themselves sailing through the heart of the gale. A nearby British weather station called the storm the Monster of the Month. Wind speeds reached 93 miles or 150 kilometers per hour and waves easily reached nearly 50 feet or 15 meters high. Still, the crew of the Munchen indicated no concern. As radio operator Jörg Ernst conversed with his friend Heinz Lohmann on the German cruise ship Karibe, 2,400 nautical miles away, just after midnight on December 12th, he casually noted that the ship was fighting through a rough storm and had taken some damage to the bridge and some portholes, but he seemed largely unfazed. This was not the first time the seasoned radio men experienced a winter storm on the North Atlantic. Ernst continued to describe their situation, but Lohman could not understand the rest of the message. He asked Ernst if he wanted to try and find a stronger frequency, but Ernst declined. He signed off by telling his friend, have a good trip and see you soon. The night continued and the storm raged on. At around 3.10 a.m., the radio operator on the Greek freighter Marion picked up a chilling signal. Badly distorted by atmospheric interference, he could just barely decipher a weak SOS message sent in Morse code. Soon, a Soviet vessel, the Maria Yermolova, also began picking up these distress calls. Over a series of messages, the Marion was able to make out the word forward, as well as the ship's name and position, Another ship picked up the words 50 degrees starboard and the word Articus. These fragmented messages presented a puzzle that continues to baffle investigators and we'll explore their possible meanings later in this video. Radio operators all over the North Atlantic continued to receive fragmented messages from the Munchen, broadcast using emergency equipment, suggesting the Munchen had lost power. At 4.43 a.m., Multiple radio stations began receiving automatic emergency signals from the ship. This continued until 7.34, when U.S. stations changed to another frequency, but it's thought that these messages continued to transmit for hours. Initially, despite the concerning calls for help, there was very little alarm. The Munchen was well known to be a capable vessel, and while it was clear that she had run into trouble in the storm, few thought that the situation was as dire as it would soon prove to be. But by mid-morning, as the weak messages continued and the storm raged on, an international search and rescue effort was soon organized. Within hours, it would balloon into a massive search effort that would uncover a series of clues that hinted to a horrifying end for the Munchen and her crew. For centuries, sailors have told stories about massive walls of water that come out of nowhere and swallow ships in an instant. But by 1978, the field of oceanography had yet to recognize this phenomenon. As ships became larger and more resilient, encounters with freak waves became more survivable, and in the 20th century, a handful of notable ships began returning to port with horrifying stories to share. In January of 1910, a massive wave smashed into the RMS Lusitania, permanently damaging her bridge. In December 1942, while carrying over 11,000 US troops, the RMS Queen Mary was hit broadside by a 92-foot or 28-meter wave. 
After listing a terrifying 52 degrees to port, she slowly righted herself. The incident inspired the 1969 novel and subsequent 1972 film, The Poseidon Adventure. And in 1966, one of these massive walls of water smashed into the Italian luxury liner Michelangelo, ripping into her superstructure and killing three on board. But without any official recordings or studies, these occurrences were poorly understood. For a number of years, researchers used a mathematical formula called the Gaussian function to predict wave height. This formula showed that waves over 98 feet or 30 meters were only possible once every 10,000 years. While researchers suspected that this phenomenon was more common, it wasn't until January 1st, 1995, when a wave that reached 84 feet or 25.6 meters was recorded by sensors on the Dropner gas platform in the North Sea. This event set off research into the rogue wave phenomenon that continues to this day. A rogue wave is defined as a wave that reaches more than twice the significant wave height in the area at the time. While still rare, oceanographers now know that these massive waves happen several times a year all over the world. We're only just beginning to understand rogue waves, but it's believed that there is no one cause that triggers these events. Rather, they are created by a series of factors that converge when conditions are just right. It's thought that high winds and currents can create an unusual sea state where a normal wave begins to draw in energy from the waves around it, generating one massive wave for a brief period of time. Areas with strong currents that run counter to wave direction seem to create these conditions more often. Cape Agolis in South Africa has been identified as a prime example of one of these locations. Though researchers are beginning to understand rogue waves, we're still a long way from accurately predicting this deadly phenomenon. But we know much more than we did when the Munchen sailed into that brutal North Atlantic storm in 1978. While the Munchen's SOS messages were picked up as early as 3.10 a.m. on December 12th, Hopog Lloyd didn't receive word of the unfolding crisis until 6 a.m. An international search and rescue operation, coordinated by His Majesty's Coast Guard at Land's End in Cornwall, began organizing at 7.30, and the first Royal Air Force reconnaissance aircraft, a Hawker Sidley Nimrod, took off at 9.30 to begin the search. These initial efforts were slowed by the ongoing intensity of the storm. Winds continued to exceed hurricane force as searchers began arriving in the general area, reported by the Munchen's distress calls. At 3.30 p.m., the Coast Guard appointed the Dutch salvage tug Smit Rotterdam, commanded by Captain P.F. De Nijs, as the on-scene search and rescue coordinator. By the next day, December 13th, three planes and six ships searched for the Munchen. At 9.06 that morning, Michael F. Sinnott, an amateur radio enthusiast in Brussels, picked up a voice transmission on a strange radio frequency typically used by a German radio station. The transmission was clear, but background noise made it difficult to make out the full message. But Sinnott was able to hear the Munchen's name and call sign. He only had a receiver for that particular frequency, so he was unable to communicate with the message's sender. He relayed the message to officials, and later he told investigators that the voice he heard was calm and spoken English with a heavy German accent. Later that afternoon, between 5 and 7.14 p.m., the U.S. Naval Station in Rota, Spain picked up 10 weak Mayday calls sent using Morse code. These messages mentioned 28 persons on board and the Munchen's call sign. They were likely recorded and played on a loop. As the day went on, the search continued. Wind speeds remained high, and visibility was limited to just two to four nautical miles. The next day, December 14th, the German Navy joined the search efforts, adding additional planes and vessels. Winds decreased slightly, but still presented a challenge. By now, all radio messages from the Munchen had stopped, but signals were still heard from her emergency buoy. Finally, at 7 p.m., the British freighter King George found the first traces of the missing ship, a single unused life raft. 
Soon, the Hapag Lloyd Freighter Air Longen found three of the Munchen's lighters. Over the following days, as wind speeds eased, the search grew. On December 15th, a British Nimrod aircraft spotted two of the ship's orange buoys, and a salvage tug called the Titan picked up another life raft. This one was covered in oil, with no signs that it had ever been used by any of the Munchen's crew. On December 16th, a third unused life raft was found by the MS Badenstein. By December 17th, the weather had calmed considerably, making search efforts easier. Ships combed the area spaced three nautical miles apart, covering a massive expanse. Soon, a fourth life raft was found by the Sealand consumer. Three life vests were also sighted. And that afternoon, the Dusseldorf Express discovered the Munchen's emergency radio buoy smeared with oil. Over the next few days, the search continued to grow, but hope that anyone from the ill-fated cargo ship could be found alive was fading. Days passed without any additional discoveries, and on December 20th, the international search effort was called off. The German government and Hapag Lloyd decided to continue leading search efforts for another two days, but this also proved unsuccessful. At sundown on December 22nd, the last efforts to find any of the Munchen surviving crew members were called off. Over 80 merchant and naval vessels from a number of countries and 13 aircraft from the United Kingdom, United States, Portugal, and Germany all took part in the massive search effort. The last critical trace of the Munchen was found on February 16, 1979, when the car transporter Don Carlos discovered and salvaged her starboard side lifeboat. No other trace of the Munchen has ever been found. An official investigation into the loss of the Munchen was conducted by the Maritime Authority in Bremerhaven. They released an official report on the incident in June 1980. In it, they found no evidence of any defect in the design, furnishings, equipment, condition, loading, or manning of the ship that could have caused her sinking. Investigators zeroed in on the lone starboard lifeboat. They found that the large vertical pins that once held the lifeboat in place were bent back from forward to aft, indicating that a massive force struck the forward starboard side of the ship, forcing the lifeboat back and tearing it from its pins. The lifeboat's position on the ship's superstructure was usually 66 feet or 20 meters above the waterline. Investigators concluded that the severe weather the Munchen encountered created an unusual event that led to her sinking. This was before rogue waves were understood or even widely thought to exist, so the vocabulary used in the report was left vague. Officially, the exact fate of the Munchen remains unsolved. But taken altogether, the investigation and radio messages received over the course of the event paint a compelling picture of what likely happened to the Munchen on that fateful night. Dozens of radio messages were received by numerous operators both on shore and on various vessels in the area. Most of these messages were nearly unintelligible, but a handful of words and phrases were deciphered, including the ship's name and position, as well as the words forward, 50 degrees starboard, Articus and Collision. The words forward and collision probably refer to the event that caused the ship's distress. 50 degrees starboard could likely refer to a list, but it's been pointed out that these words could also refer to an overtaking angle or a localization. The word Articus has sparked a great deal of speculation. The investigation figured that this was a recording error and the word was supposed to be antennas which would make sense in describing the damage. But others have suggested that this could have referred to a Russian ship in the area named the Artemida, which was likely the closest ship to the Munchen at the time of the message. Unfortunately, the position given in these transmissions proved to be at least 100 nautical miles off from the Munchen's actual location at the time. This critical mistake slowed search efforts in those critical early hours. The transmission picked up by Michael F. Sennett on December 13th is by far the strangest. The frequency, typically used by a German radio station, 
was one that the Moonshin's emergency power would not have been strong enough to broadcast on. If this message was authentic, it would suggest that the Moonshin was briefly able to restore power long enough to transmit. But why they would choose that frequency is a mystery. Hopog Lloyd officials believed that the messages were authentic. While strange, they would support the widely held theory of what happened to the Moonshin. Taken altogether, with a modern understanding of rogue waves, it's now commonly believed that on the night of December 12th, while the Moonshin was fighting through the storm, she suddenly fell into a deep trough. Before she could recover, a massive wall of water, likely 100 feet or 30 meters high, smashed into the ship. The force of the water did major damage to her superstructure, ripping the lifeboat from its pinnings, caving in windows, and likely destroying critical equipment. The crippled ship, now powerless and unable to steer, was left to the mercy of the storm, where she was battered by waves until she eventually flooded and perhaps even capsized. Based on the length of time that emergency messages were transmitted, it's believed that the Moonshin remained floating for up to 33 hours. She likely drifted with a heavy list, making it almost impossible to move around, trapping her crew all over the doomed ship until she finally disappeared beneath the waves. It's a chilling end to a ship that was once thought to be practically unsinkable. As of the making of this video, the wreck of the Moonshin has never been found. But her story serves as a reminder of the incredible bravery shown by merchant mariners, including those who sail today. Though shipping is considerably safer thanks to lessons learned from tragedies like the Moonshin, sailors still sacrifice and endure the terrifying might of the seas, all to keep our world moving forward. Thank you so much for watching. This topic was heavily requested and I'm glad I finally got a chance to share it. What story should I cover next? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already for more stories like this one. I'd like to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon. They would definitely give me a ride to the airport. All right, crew, that's all I've got. Till the next one, be nice to people.